God and human person. The Father, the Son, the Spirit, God. The human person, the church, human nature. This is the focus of his writings and his teachings of John of the Cross. He cannot, he does not write about God apart from writing about God desiring union with man. And he cannot write about the human person without writing about the human person desiring in need of union with God. He can't, he does not write about them because he cannot conceive of them apart. God and the human person. The union that John of the Cross writes about is a union that is a living union. One that's filled with love. It is as well an existential union. What do I mean by that? It's something we're supposed to experience, that union. We're made to experience it. We need to experience it. It's not simply a matter of thought or speculation or reflection, but something that touches us where we live, this union. Wherever it is that I put the values of my life is where I'm going to feel the effects and the reality of divine union. There's the uh, book, well, there's a the, uh, more famous book of the comparison of uh, St. Teresa with uh, Carl Jung, German or Swiss psychologist, Spiritual Pilgrims is called. There's also another little book that came out two or three years ago, a comparison of Carl Jung and St. John of the Cross. Basically, in my basic prejudice with regards to what St. John of the Cross writes about and what psychologists in talking about integration or individuation, that you know, there's the first, second, third books of the ascent. First and second books of the night. Spiritual canonical and living flame. And if that's sort of like a progression line, which it's supposed to be the way to have it presented in the book, that's sort of the logical progression. This is eternity, the living flame, the desire and experience of what is eternal. And this is the progression in the development of the spiritual life, active night of the senses and passive night of the senses and active night of the spirit and passive night of the spirit. Or active night of the senses, active night of the spirit, passive night and passive night. That what modern psychology, especially even Jungian psychology, reaches to is somewhere in, in the first book of the Ascent of Mount Carmel. Because, I mean, that's not talking about the intervention of God. Psychology, well, I mean, Carl Jung himself says that there's a point where psychology cannot go in testing God or in talking about religion and its effects. Because it's not subject to test. But what modern psychology or psychology of the human person or the self-help section of a bookstore talks about is up into the first book of the Ascent of Mount Carmel, the first 15 chapters. Beyond that, there's, there's another dimension involved, and that's the dimension of God's activity in human life. That's the whole dimension of union. But, important thing, without this first part, these don't happen. That's the beginning, and unless you make a beginning, there's no ending. So that the things that, that happen through psychology are essential to the whole realization of what union with God is. St. Teresa complains in the way of perfection, not in the way of perfection, in the interior castles with the wiles of the devil to make us not know ourselves. And in our time, I mean, there's some people that replace spirituality with psychology, and there's some people that need psychology that have nothing to do with it because they don't want to know themselves. And since uh, it's, it's, uh, so there's a real point where psychology is utterly necessary for making any progress in the spiritual life. But it's not the spiritual life. It's not equal to. It's not the whole journey of the spiritual life. Union with God goes much beyond Simple psychological integration. But simple psychological integration is essential to the spiritual life. 
Now, before we continue to talk about union, there's just two other quotes that I want to give as the foundation for this union with God in love. The one is from Living Flame, 328. That's on page 620. It's the very first lines of number 28. In the first place, it should be known that if a person is seeking God, his beloved is seeking him much more. If you are looking for God, God is looking for you much more. That's a rather fundamental insight in spiritual life. Augustine had the same thing. Late have I loved you, O beauty ever ancient, ever new. I was out looking all around for you, and you were inside waiting for me. More within me than I within myself. In the first place, it should be known that if a person is seeking God, his beloved is seeking him much more. The others from the spiritual canticle, 22.5. Spiritual canticle, 22.5, page 498. It's in the third paragraph of number 5. Number 5 starts on page 497. Pardon me, it's in the second paragraph. Consequently, he, God, is for her, the soul, an enchanting, desirable garden for her entire aim. And the word in Spanish, aim, is the Spanish word deseos, plural. All the desires of the soul in all her works is the consummation and perfection of this state. She never rests until reaching it. Another reference to St. Augustine, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. We never rest until reaching union. That the experience of frustration that we experience in life is the desire for you. We're made for union with God. Again, remember that infinite capacity that I talked about last night. That nothing will satisfy us but union with God. That's why we're restless. The Gospel of St. John places in perspective the persons and the dimensions involved in the union of love that John of the Cross writes about. And using the term union of the soul with God or union of man with God or union of the person with God, we're using a terminology both religious and mystical that is common among the history and spirituality of various mystical traditions, Christian and non-Christian. Because he is talking about a, fun, a reality so fundamental. This is why I mentioned that he's required reading. John, of course, is required reading in Buddhist monasteries. Because he talks about a reality that is so fundamental to human life and experience. We desire union, one, oneness. Not just within ourselves, but with others and, and in the world, in creation. He's writing about a reality so fundamental and an experience of that reality that's so radical that it is the possibility of, com that there is the possibility of comparison with other mystical traditions. Sufism of the Islamic. Buddhist tradition, Shinto tradition. But the only real thing that is shared in common is the experience and the language of expression. Because, as I always meant, John of the Cross's beginning point always is with revelation. Scripture. So to recognize the influence of Scripture, of the Scriptures in St. John of the Cross, is to recognize the base of experience for John of the Cross. I may have mentioned the other night that there's 31 times altogether that St. John of the Cross quotes other people, Augustine and Aquinas, 31 times in his works, and 1,100 plus times that he quotes Scripture. So Scripture is the foundation of his work. Revelation as God's intervention, intervening, 
coming among, coming between us. And the word intervention means to come between. Come along. God's intervention in time and space in the history and nature of humanity is the experience which formed John of the Cross as a person, as a mystic, and as a doctor of the church. God's entrance into the life of humanity through the event of the incarnation, through the reconciliation not only of man with God, but among men, within ourselves, as persons, that is to say, the creation of the community of believers highlights the place of the church. The mystery of the church only finds its place in the life of each, each Christian when it is seen in relationship to the mystery of the union that God desires among us. God desires that we be one with each other. That is what gives the place, the church, its place. That God desires this union. And when we perceive or understand or see the church as the place to experience union, then the humanity of the church becomes bearable. But if it's not the place to experience union with each other and with God, then the humanity of, ch of the church is an interference. It's not bearable. In order to underline the place and the importance of the church and the teachings of St. John of the Cross with regards to our union with God and our union with each other, I want to just cite three different places in the spiritual canticle. 547 in the spiritual canticle. Page 547. Now, this is commentary on the verse. Let us rejoice, beloved, and let us go forth to behold ourselves in your beauty. This is paragraph 5. Now I'm talking about on page 547. I would read that paragraph 5 out loud, but it's a tongue twister. Because he uses the word beauty 21 times in a paragraph. Now he's a poet. Poets, instrument, words. Words used on purpose. I'll just read a little bit of it. This means, let us so act that by means of this loving activity, namely the spiritual life, the spiritual life, we may attain to the vision of ourselves in your beauty in eternal life. That is, that I may be so transformed in your beauty that we may be alike in beauty and both behold ourselves in your beauty, possessing now your very beauty. This in such a way that each looking at the other may be seen in the other, his own beauty, since both are your beauty alone, I being absorbed in your beauty. Hence I shall see you in your beauty, and you shall see me in your beauty, and I shall see myself in your beauty. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Wherefore I shall be you in your beauty, and you will be me in your beauty. Okay. This is the adoption of the sons of God. What does it mean to be adopted son of God? An adopted child to be beautiful in God's beauty. All right, that's the description of the human person. Where anybody ever gets the idea that these mystics, John of the Cross or Teresa, have uh, warped the views of humanity, they haven't read them. What's St. Teresa say in the very opening lines of the interior castles? The soul's a garden through which God delights to walk. The soul's a castle entirely made out of crystal. That's what the human person is. This is the adoption of the sons of God. This is the human person. Beautiful. We will indeed declare to God, the very Son of God, what the very Son said to the Eternal Father through St. John, all my things are yours and yours are mine. That he is the natural Son of God and we say it by participation since we are adopted sons. He declared this not only for himself, the head, but for his whole mystical body, the church. It's because the church is the mystical body of Christ that we participate individually in that beauty. That we realize as individuals that beauty. See, God's desire for union among ourselves is essential 
to the realization of his union with us individually. It's not an optional thing. I mean, it's what's in other words, it's not that what is needed is that we be one with God, and it'd be a nice thing if we also got to be one with each other. Not, it's not that optional. The things work together. Union among ourselves, it works together with union with God. The inherent beauty of the church as the spouse of Christ is causative, causes that realization of that beauty within the individual. The second reference I want to make is more implicit, but it strikes at the very nature of what the church is in God's plan. And that's on page 550. 37, Canticle 37.3. And then we will go on to the high caverns of the, in the rock. The high caverns of this rock are the sublime, exalted, and deep mysteries of God's wisdom in Christ, in the hypostatic union of the human nature with the divine word, and the corresponding union of men with God, and the mystery of the harmony between God's justice and mercy with respect to the manifestations of his judgment in the salvation of the human race. So, I mean, this, the union of the person is a hypostatic union, therefore the union of God with humanity. And because of the union of God with humanity, the presence of his justice, seeking first the kingdom of God and his justice, all things uniting us together in the way that we live, that God's presence in humanity is what creates the church. Okay, what creates union, therefore, among us. What, so that the catechism said, the first of the four marks of the church, one, the church is one, holy, catholic, and apostolic. If it's not one, it's not holy, it's not Catholic, and it's not apostolic. Union is that the basis of the church's holiness and Catholicity and apostolicity. Union. Because it's not just union among ourselves, it's union with God. The final place I want to quote is on uh, page 500. This is regarded with the place of the church as the experience of union. Don't sit under the apple tree. Paragraph 6 on page 500. Beneath the apple tree, there I took you for my own. There I offered you my hand and restored you where your mother was corrupted. Then in paragraph 6, he says that whole paragraph I read last night about the espousal that is made on the cross. All right, It happens poco a poco, little by little at the soul's pace. He says... For that espousal, accomplished immediately when God gives the first grace which is bestowed on each one at baptism. Just the, that reference there, that little reference, bestowed on each one at baptism. Union already exists. It exists in the church. The incorporation in baptism is the incorporation in the possibility of realizing, experiencing union with all, with everyone. It comes through the cross to human nature, now redeemed under the cross, and through human nature to each individual. Okay. What I'm trying to show is how far-reaching are the dimensions of the union about which St. John of the Cross speaks. It's transformation in the Trinity. It's a prolongation of the hypostatic union. It is the union of the second person of the Trinity with the church and with each soul. This union is realized, it's made real as a result of the long process known as salvation history. What are the steps in salvation history? Creation, Incarnation, redemption, baptism, and the process known as the spiritual life. All of us participate in all those levels. Creation, incarnation, redemption, baptism, 
and the spiritual life. This process takes place in the community of the church. And because it takes place in the community of the church, in the community of, of, of that oneness, then from the context of the church it takes place in each soul. As St. John of the Cross then considers it, union is theological. Its basis is the Trinity. It's Christ-centered union, in that the pattern and the power of this union is the life of Christ. It's ecclesial. By that I mean it happens in and because of the church. Even for those outside of the church, salvation happens because of the church. Those outside, there are people outside the church who are saved. But it happens because of the church. Not because they're in it, but because of the church. Union, then, also is sacramental. In that the concrete means of sanctification have been given to us in the sacramental life of the church. And it's historical. In that the union of God with man takes place not despite time and space, but in and through time and space. It's historical in that union with God takes place in my life, not despite my life, my body, my psychology, my psychological state, but in my life, my body, my psychological state. Union is not just between my soul and God. It's between me and God. Between the individual, the person, and God. It's personal and it's interpersonal. My union with God affects, touches every one of my relationships. Union then, in St. John of the Cross, rightly understood, is a synonym for the following terms. Deification, Christification, Redemption, Salvation, Individuation, Integration. Deification, Christification, Redemption, Salvation, Individuation, Integration. St. John of the Cross wants it all for us. Not just that he wants us to be integrated personally in our own personal lives. He wants us to be sons of God, God's by participation, as he says. So it's deification also. God's by participation. What the Son is, by grace, by nature rather, we are by grace. United so much with God that we are God through participation in God. Why don't we stop there and take a break for about 20 minutes. And I'll finish up on you. Yes. Father, what are the uh, dynamics of original sin? You know, what, what effect do they have? On, what, what is the effect it has on our human nature? We don't intend yeah. Okay. I'm going to answer that in the next talk and the next talk, and the next talk. Because the next talk, and the next talk, and the next talk, the next talk is on negation, or self-denial in the spiritual life. This third talk is on man, the human person in relationship to God. And the third talk on why does it take so long, is on the, the effects of original sin in human nature. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's right. 
still resonant because union is not a static state. Union is a dynamic state. Okay, there's power in union. Of course, that's where d dynamic comes from the Greek word dunamis or something like that that means power. It's something that's alive because the image that it uses in the living flame is that the soul, the flame is darting about, shooting, sparkling constantly. That this, this union with God is something that is eternally dynamic. A little bit of an example. St. Teresa writes the um, book of her life in 1563. The book that's miscalled sometimes the autobiography. And in that she talks about how many waters. Four waters of prayer. <clears throat> Fourteen years later she writes the interior castles. And how many castles are there? There's seven stages there. So for one year when she writes the autobiography there's four stages. Fourteen years later there's seven stages. I think if she had lived 15 more years there might have been 15 gardens of love or prayer. Because if they don't, our saints, any saint, all the saints together, don't write the sum total of what eternity is. So that even in that mystical matrimony and that never-ending never uh, union with God, there's constant progression in that union with God. Yes? 49. Yeah. 67. St. Teresa was born in 1515 and died in 1582. There was 27 years difference in age. John of the Cross was born in 1542 and died in 1591. When St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa met in Medina del Campo in 1568, St. Teresa was 52, St. John of the Cross was 25. Now, any other questions? Yes, John. You were talking about union being something that is something immediate, immediate, it's like it's something that we experience also on the way. Mm -hmm. I see. St. John of Cross's definition of contemplation that he gives in the first book of the Dark Knight, chapter 10, someplace, I think. It, um, he, it's the divine inflow. It's the loving inflow of God. Inflow. I mean, we don't, that's not a good English word. We don't talk about inflow. But that's what it's trying to translate the word influence. What influence is. What, you have influence on You have an input. You have a way into them. You know, what contemplation is, is the divine inflow, loving inflow, God entering in, you know, so. The mistake is, and this is one of the things that needs to be purified in the spiritual life through the sentimental karma we talk about, is what our expectation, expectations of what contemplation is. This is why I think we have to very much be aware of things that happen in different times and cultures and understand. If I think contemplation means bumping my head on the ceiling when, through levitation and prayer, and it never happens, I'm going to think, oh, I'm going to miss where I am being influenced by God, where God is inflowing, where I'm being transformed and changed and matured in my relationship to God and others. Okay, so that one of the things, the thing that's purified ultimately is our idea of God. That's what's purified. So the God is, the other night I talked about that brother, when, when John of the Cross asked the brother Francisco in recreation, who is God? And uh, he said, God is whoever he wants to be. And St. John of the Cross got ecstatic over things. <laughs> who is God? Well, he's a supreme being that made all things. Who is God? God is whoever God wants to be. God is however he wishes to be. Freedom. Okay. Oh, Free from my ideas. That's what he's got to be first free from. In order for him to be himself in my life. So, and the other thing, too, especially for those of us, I'm one of them who, who may be tempted to be more romantic about things. And I always think, 
life, my life is going to begin sometime soon. Here I am on the other side of 40, and I'm still waiting for my life to begin sometime soon. You know, it's that beautiful life where everything comes together. No, all these 40 years where things have been coming together is part of what life is. There's also contemplation in there. And it takes, it takes seeing it. So in order to see it, I have to remove what prevents me from seeing it. That's what the ascetical part of the spiritual life is, removing my expectations of what life ought to be so that I can see how it is, actually. I'd like to make reference to the, when you're discussing a hypostatic meaning. Um, it says in, in the first uh, chapter of John that in the beginning was the Word. And I'm wondering, uh, how did the second person of the Trinity exist in this uh, eternal nature? Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Uh, my take on this, again, is uh, know thyself. All right? You're approaching God uh, from a Carmelite standpoint uh, by, there's a contradiction here, by uh, into the dark night, by less knowing, less knowing, less knowing. So, you can you say well how how come you have all these these contradictions because for an infant the infant will suckle from the breast a man will die on the quantity of a, 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 and quality of breast food a man might eat a steak you give a steak to a child an infant a newborn they will die so circumstances change so you have to come off the sweet breasts of understanding know yourself know yourself know yourself it's painful to know yourself. And uh, so he begins to talk about this, and he's talking a little bit about the hypostatic union, which is a fancy name for just like Christ and people, the church, Christ and the church. So he's talking here about how it's personal. It's personal. And in the end, he talks about how God is whoever he wants to be. But union with God is beyond the psychological, okay? Know yourself. If you're looking for God, God is looking for you. That's the beautiful thing. And God wants much more for you, okay, than you want for yourself, all right? So in, we're talking here union of the second person of the Trinity with a, with a church, all right? So that's where the Carmelites, when they're present, they get into the trouble with a lot of people. John the Cross was put in prison and beaten on a regular basis. Teresa was locked out uh, of her monastery. They're trying to integrate Christ, union with his church, and people don't always accept that. All right, you see that? Uh, they consider Christ salt in their wound, okay? And they need a little bit of salt, okay? So that's where this is going on. And it takes place within community of the church. Here's the beautiful thing. Did you hear what he said about salvation happens because of the church? Even for those outside the church, it happens because of the church. And you could be outside the church because you never came to the church, but you could be outside the church because you were suppressed, put outside the church, okay? So uh, remember, salvation happens because of the church. So uh, right now in many parts of our diocese in the world, people are suppressed. Uh, they're suppressed for many reasons well, beyond the scope of this. But remember, uh, there is a community of the church and much takes place within that community. And uh, you're still part of that community even if you're suppressed. So if they lock the doors on you, this isn't to encourage you. Karma is to encourage you. They lock the doors on Teresa of Avila. If they begin to... Uh, confine you for the men, confine you uh, in a room. How they can do that today is confine you by mess with your income, your family, and confine you in a in a box that can be invisible to lots of people because if you move this way, you move that way, uh, you get into trouble. Uh, they harm your interests. And I'm talking about what Bishop Barron talks about, the, uh, the uh, storm of wickedness in the church. So I think of ISIS, they put women and children in front of them. Oftentimes, the wicked, uh, Pope Francis refers to them as monsters in the church, will uh, put friendship 
between, between you and them so that they are protected. They're very close. So again, you may be suppressed in ways where you have to stand and endure a lot of things right in the open of the bishop. Bishop can be five feet away and doesn't know that you're being suppressed. There's image management going on. And if you speak out, uh, the bad people in the parish will hurt your family, your friends, your business interests, uh, or your marriage. So karma is there. And you hear it about in the very beginning. Wow of the devil. So not no self. The mysticism that can take on, or the wowness can take on, is done so that you don't know yourself. Did you catch that? Very beginning of that. Okay. So I hope this helps you. Again, we are the, uh, we're particularly sensitive to this because we're the Flint OCDS com Flint OCS community in Flint, Michigan, and we have appended SC suppressed Catholics, suppressed Carmelites. We're trying to reach out for those who have left the Catholic Church, contemplating leaving the Catholic Church, have left faith in God altogether, and encouraging them that uh, that per to come back. And they've been suppressed, they gave up, and they haven't been nourished, and so we offer hope. Okay. The suppressed guy. We offer a different point of view. This is Catholicism. And uh, not only are people suppressed, communities are suppressed, and uh, uh, Catholic doctrine is suppressed. Amen. So keep us in your prayers. Again, we are, uh, for the third millennium, our pastoral plan uh, is to reach out to Asia. We hope to transfer these, these tapes soon into Chinese. And uh, Father Michael Griffin made that initial effort right around the around the year uh, 1999 or 2000. Uh, and through the Carmelite uh, friars and nuns of Taiwan and the laity there in Taiwan, we're translating uh, doctrine of the Catholic Church, particularly of Carmel, into Chinese so it could get onto the mainland. I've spoken too much here. So keep us in your thoughts and prayers and know that that you are relevant. If you desire God and you desire goodness, God desires you more than you desire him. He's pursuing you more than you're pursuing him. And remember, self-knowledge is painful, painful to realize how ugly, how, what a sinful creature you are, how many people you've hurt with your ugliness. And uh, But the remedy is going to be there. You draw closer to God. You may have to bury some dead, but you go closer to God. You become a new person. Amen.